let's get started. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop on the IDPF, the Infrastructure Data Plane Function. Um, this is a good follow-up to the Network Driver workshop we had before. And I'm going to abuse my privilege of having the mic uh, to add one more note to the previous uh, workshop that I uh, I forgot to give. So I, I gave a session on the um, OCP standardization. And I said like a year ago, Google and uh, Meta started that. Uh, but um, I forgot to mention the more important part that today it involves not just Google and Meta, but Broadcom, Intel, and NVIDIA as well. Uh, so it really is intended to be an industry consortium. So um, do join. All right, with that, let's let's move on to a different uh, type of standardization where the OCP effort focuses on the behavior of features, um, essentially being able to plug in devices with our Linux drivers and, and have um, um, some understanding of, of what they are going to, how they're going to implement the features. Um, IDPF focuses on standardization at a lower level, really at the level of the hardware. Um, so uh, in this session, um, I'll give a brief introduction of um, what IDPF, what I, how I understand what IDPF is going to uh, uh, try to solve and, and what are some alternatives um, that people are discussing uh, so that we have a context where it fits in. Um, then we'll have a set of presentations, uh, starting with Anjali, who gives a, an overview of the the um, the driver. You know, why is this the right approach um, to solving this problem? Um, and we'll we'll look into very specific details here: um, how to do feature negotiation, um, how to implement some features such as uh, EDT, which came up in the previous um, workshop as well, um, and then um, some performance numbers a software implementation of the device. Uh, and finally, we'll have a panel with all the speakers uh, with you know, plenty of room for questions at the end. Uh, so with that, um, let's dive in. So what, what problem is IDPF trying to solve? And, um, we need a single reference driver uh, in the ecosystem, which um, um, for users, this is particularly in, a, in an environment of virtualized networking, whether it is an actual um, physical function or virtual functions or um, even SIOV. Um, it's really helpful if a standard device is available to everyone. Uh, this is, of course, a, a role that VertIONet performs today. Um, and before VertIONet, um, you could see that uh, the Intel E1000 driver was often supported by things like uh, VMware uh, because it was, uh, you know, um, relatively clean and easy to implement um, reference driver. Um, so I think the, the value of a single reference driver is, is clear to users. They can take their virtual machines or whatever their image, um, and it will run uh, basically anywhere. Um, to hyperscalers, it is uh, useful that to know that um, their users um, can work, uh, their, their, v, can, their VMs can work, and when they roll out a new piece of hardware, they don't have to update um, all the distros um, and um, ask the users to upgrade their VMs, which is a very, you know, very important part from a hyperscaler point of view. Um, and uh, there's a, a benefit to vendors to say, no, if they support this reference driver, that their hardware will be, you know, viable to hyperscalers. And, and um, so, I said, for Net, basically. Um, fills this role today. So the question then, the obvious question is, you know, why um, do we need another driver? And um, one of the requirements really going forward is, you know, looking forward to the next few years or, or decade even, uh, we need a driver that can um, operate at the, the native speeds of the upcoming hardware, um, upcoming or already existing hardware. Um, and um, so I have a device driver format that can be implemented in hardware uh, and perform well. It uh, is efficient in choose of the PCI Express uh, transactions, for instance. Uh, a model that can work not just for virtual uh, networking, but for uh, the, the various ways that we basically uh, distribute um, or, or make available network devices to users. And that supports all these features that are coming down the pipeline or there are, are currently um, um, exist that um, do not exist in, in VertioNet. And so performance and, um, and feature set. Now, uh, 
could we solve this some other way? I think is a very fair question, and I expect there will be some discussion about this um, at the end in the panel. Like, um, can we support these speeds and features with Ferdeonet as is? I think it's important to uh, uh, to, to separate the um, a couple of parts here, which is the 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 pure performance of the data path is a feature of its own. Then there is the um, additional features that need to be supported, and and finally there is the these two are the data path, the hot path, and then there's the control path. Um, and can Ferdeo as is support all of these? So there are certainly patches for features like hardware timestamping for Ferdeo floating around. Ferdeo has a feature negotiations uh, system that is extensible. Um, so um, we need to we need to look into this. Um, or is it a matter that you know maybe Ferdeo is control interface indeed is extensible and, and can support all these things that are coming down the pipeline, whether it's hardware timestamps or I know, TCP direct data placement or uh, earliest um, departure time. Um, but maybe, you know, there is agreement that uh, it, it cannot scale to these speeds because of you know, inherent choices in its descriptor format, um, in its not just descriptor format of a single queue, but the, the layout of um, queues the communication um, in the data path. So where um, something like E1000 has a single queue and, and Ferdeo Net um, has um, a serif post and, and, and completion queues, um, it's more than just a descriptive format. But one option is basically to say, you know what, we can do all of this with Ferdeo Net. Um, it's not proven at this point that we can, right? So it's a, it's a pretty big if. Another is um, we, we, we can use Ferdeo Net driver and it's feature negotiation, but uh, we do need a new data path to scale to these uh, new speeds um, and probably um, to have bits in the descriptor for all these new options. Um, or do we need a, you know, a whole new device and say at some, at some point it just makes more sense to let the legacy be and uh, come up with a new device that both uh, has a, a data path that is provably skills that uh, support for these features um, and that is uh, has flexible feature negotiation. Um, so IDPF is a proposal for this. Um, uh, I think it's uh, the first concrete proposal I've seen. So it's definitely a, a good good opportunity to to look at these issues. Um, uh, it, we need to look at you know we need to it needs to demonstrate that it has the performance, it has the features. Obviously, um, I think one other question that's interesting is not just does it support um, the current set of features, but do we expect it to be a viable reference uh, device that can support features from other vendors, features that are coming down the pipeline? Um, and uh, and then the last question I, I, I'd like to um, sort of contemplate is, if if this is the right path, should this be a Vertigo device? Should it be sort of Vertigo Net 2.0, or is it better as a completely separate thing? Um, so those are some of the questions that came in, popped into my mind. Uh, when talking about IDPF. Um, and uh, I think next up, we will hear hopefully a lot of answers to these and then we'll, we can wrap up with the panel. So I gave a um, sort of a timeline where I expect to be. We're already five minutes behind, uh, my, my mistake, uh, but let's, let's try to stay um, roughly on time. Um, so just add five minutes to all of these. Um, uh, all right, with that, uh, let's start with the, the first presentation. Uh, Anjali, I'll stop presenting. Now, better. Okay, so uh, Willem uh, kind of covered a lot of things, um, and you know, so I'm going to skip over whatever is repeated on my side of the slides, but we'll still cover the pieces that he didn't. Definitely trying to develop an open industry standard, um, and from our point of view, you know, since this is a host interface uh, that is for uh, physical and uh, virtual devices, uh, as well as the feature set, device behavior and everything. Uh, we developed this particular interface and the device behavior in, um, you know, um, uh, conjunction with Google um, to satisfy the hyperscaler needs. Uh, again, all the requirements that, you know, Willem previously mentioned. Um, so yeah, high performance, Ethernet and RDMA capable, uh, broader ecosystem uh, runs on NICs, bare metal VMs, containers, emulated device, whatnot. 
um, uh, can be composed many different ways. Um, uh, one of the things that was discussed previously about the subdef functions and stuff. Yes, so we, we plan to definitely support that. It's quite popular with container use cases. Um, capability negotiation and extensibility is built into the configuration protocol that we run on this interface. Um, and the configuration is going towards uh, something we call it as device control, which is embedded software, if you may think about it that way, or the firmware. Um, um, since we plan to support an emulated software backed uh, device as well, it can run on non-native IDPF uh, devices as well. Um, supports uh, all the ecosystem related things like live migration and things. Uh, why? I think we went over this. Um, present hardware optimized PCI footprint is, uh, is not very good for interfaces like uh, um, Bortio 0.95, 1 1.1, whatnot. So we had to um, make sure that uh, we are um, optimizing this to the extent possible for um, all the goodness that the device can bring. Um, yeah, and some of the other features like RDMA support and advanced features for the cloud that we'll go over. Uh, here is quite an eye chart for comparison if people are interested in what does the PCIe, uh, you know, uh, footprint look like when we compare what IO to IDPF. The things in red, and I, I it's just, uh, I'm not sure it's very readable. Um, uh, but yeah, you, you will have these slide decks. They will be posted. Have a look at it. What it's, this says is all the things on the red, which is under the 0.95, it shows where you're, you're making extra P PCI transactions on the transmit or on the receive. And it became less on what IO 1.1. Uh, and you have just two reds as compared to the right, which is, of course, what we believe is ideal IDPF. Uh, so we have removed all the, you know, access PCI reads, which are per packet versus even the batch ones. Um, and yeah, so this is based on, uh, I mean, I, the reason we are presenting this is because our devices support both what IO and IDPF. And if I may want to, you know, assume like most people, the Vertai interface is not the native interface on our device. We uh, use uh, some embedded cores to kind of translate Vertio to IDPF. And of course, um, you know, because the PCI footprint is not the same and some other issues, we don't really, um, you know, get the relevant performance. Or if you were to match the performance, of course, you end up burning a lot more uh, parallel embedded cores and, you know, synopsis course if not uh, that so so you know it's it's always um, an interface that is developed uh, top uh, to bottom you know from software to hardware uh, definitely it's hard to kind of see where the performance challenges will come from the hardware side but if it is developed from bottom to top where you keep the hardware uh, you know PCIe latency and you know the issues in mind then you can optimize for it really well so that's pretty much the gist i'm not going to try and uh, uh, do any justice to, uh, to this but i can answer any question on this because so i i'm comparing what i point nine five one dot oh to idpf so they have their own descriptors I'm not using what I descriptors on IDPF, but I'm saying when you use the what I queues and descriptors and stuff like that, how many transactions you have? Absolutely, yeah. Correct. So the submission, you know, so we're not comparing how different the descriptors are. I am comparing the transactions. How many transactions do you have on the PCI bus when you have to deal with one packet transmit, one packet receive, and you know uh, if you're batching, what happens? Things like that. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I think uh, you're pointing out the RX side, we haven't put the length, and yes, we should do that. Okay, thanks, Rajiv. Um, Okay, so how are we going about this? So we, we uh, last week we uh, announced uh, uh, OSS uh, TC for IDPF, which is right now uh, there are three uh, you know members so far, Intel, Google, and Marvel, uh, and many more to join. Uh, there are some in discussion, and hopefully they'll join soon. Um, and in December we'll have our first TC meeting. Uh, by the time you know, hopefully we have some more uh, vendors joining in. Uh, what are we standardizing? We are standardizing the host interface uh, so that we can have a single driver, device behavior, setup and configuration flows, and have, as I mentioned, a single community driver so that it is a little bit more than what uh, Willem is trying to do on uh, OCP side where he's, uh, you know, uh, trying to standardize the features and, you know, different uh, how each feature should behave but we're going for um, a little bit more which is uh, you know have a common driver and that is possible only if we have a common host interface um, of course we plan to um, not just uh, uh, have a driver submitted upstream there will be a spec that is part of this TC, OSS TC where it will be published uh, there will be a software backend which is I believe it's already upstreamed uh, and uh, Meow or Chenbo is gonna talk about it. And there is the live migration support for it that is being worked on and uh, hopefully we'll present that soon as well. Uh, what is it? Network equivalent of uh, NVMe, uh, yeah, um, marketing slide. So yeah, so what I on net, uh, you know, if you see on the networking story side, IDPF is equivalent of NVMe. Uh, and IDPF is coming from the hardware world, Vertao and Vertao block came from the software side. So yeah, I'm just kind of giving some idea of how they fit into the network and storage um, uh, uh, subsystems. Um, I'm not sure I... Uh... Yeah, so I mean, there will be lots of features that we will go through it one by one. We want to take this interface not just for like a VM or a container. We also want to take it up to an application and that you would see as well uh, as a socket level interface, which is passed through based on the same data plane that we describe on IDPF. And that would be something that will come in the next NetDev um, workshop, I, I hope so. Um, what else should I mention here? Um, why did we take this approach? Uh, so this is a little bit of a history, again, going from monolith monolithic NIC drivers that we had. Uh, you know, like if you look at the ICE or I4E driver, uh, those, they, there was a separate PF and VF driver. The PF driver was a monolithic control plane and data plane driver. Um, and and uh, we, as we move forward with IPUs and DPUs, keeping a common uh, control plane and a data plane driver is not the best thing to do. So we kind of separated that out. And IDPF is a data plane driver. You know, that's, that's the gist of it. It is not a control plane driver. This is not where you have all your uh, crazy dev link knobs to configure your device. This is where you uh, just configure your interface. Um, and, and we have tried, um, you know, as much as possible to um, let uh, the, the infrastructure side not uh, be visible on the, the, the NIC interface, which is uh, on the host side. And so it's more of an untrusted interface. Uh, it should definitely have all the stateless offloads and anything that is needed for application acceleration. Um, but, uh, you know, anything that is terminated on the device, which is needed by the infrastructure is not exposed to IDPF. So, um, like, you know, how do you set up your tunnels? You know, if you're terminating in your device, then you don't set it up from IDPF, you set it up from your control plane function. Uh, but yeah, if you need uh, inline crypto uh, for your application, you of course set it up from IDPF. 
whereas infrastructure crypto will be set up from uh, the infrastructure side, which is shown here as IPU SDK or IPU management and things like that. So uh, you would see more of the split, uh, not just on our IPUs, but you will see that going on even for our ethnics because it makes a lot of sense uh, for that kind of isolation. Uh, where can I run IDPF? Um, uh, Willem, please let me know if I'm running over time and I'll hurry up. So uh, we are, uh, we, you can run IDPF on physical NIC, on bare metal hosting, multi-host setup, like uh, Shrijit was asking about. And uh, you can run IDPF in the VM as a VM hosting setup. You can run IDPF within your embedded cores on the IPU side or DPU side. So um, again, for the same reason, for data plane functionality, not so much for the control plane. So yeah, all of those uh, is what we plan to support. Um, feature set, uh, you know, standard uh, features like Willa mentioned stateless offloads and uh, making sure those are generic and not protocol specific and uh, this should say GSO, not TSO, but yeah. Um, so, and RSS and other things. Um, um, Linux specific features, um, AFXDP, receive site coalescing, RDMA header split, earliest departure time. Uh, and we'll go in some of these features in, in, in detail how we configure and uh, is deployed on the device. Um, Okay, with that, I give it to Sridhar and Pavan, who will talk about the infrastructure data path function. But I think Srijit has a question. Hello? Yeah, there's a couple of questions on the, on the uh, bridge. Um, so I'll ask the first one and I'll add a question to that. So this is from more. By RDMA, do you mean something which is not Rocky or iWarp? And uh, I'm going to make that a more generic question, which is, you are, as part of IDPF, prescribing a set of queue formats, it can't be one, um, that you expect every vendor to subscribe to, right? Right, that yes. So the, there will be a few different uh, types of queue formats uh, coming both from the LAN Ethernet side and RDMA side. And that's not uh, some, uh, there are a few to choose from. Of course, it is not, you know, bring your own queue format, that wouldn't work. Um, uh, the but, the but that's also the problem with the statement, right? Because every NIC has a queue format for a reason. Um, right. But then, you know, some point in order to have a generic uh, interface like Word.io, you have to come to um, a common ground, right? So that's the way, uh, just, just one second. Say and the other question about RDMA, when I say RDMA, it's transport agnostic. So I'm not going to say Rocky or IWARP or XYZ because you would see that. It's a word queue is what you're actually. Right, doing, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, we can do that, right? Hang on. What makes IDPF generic? It has a, a backing from more than one uh, company and vendor. That's about it. Uh, there are two vendors right now, oh, yeah. Intel and Marvel. Yeah, I just put up another question on the screen. Yeah. Uh, this is from Or Gellet. Can you explain, elaborate what is not optimal enough in these two standards? Uh, which two standards? Uh, yeah, so, uh, or I had a slight which was comparing the PCIe DMA transactions. It was quite an eye chart, so I can't really describe it, but please do look at it. It describes what is not optimal on the data path for 0.95 versus 1.1 and IDPF. Uh, and then so you will get a really good feel for it. Uh, the other part is the configuration as well for a hardware to kind of have tons of registers to go configure. It's not ideal. You would rather have a config queue or an admin queue. So you don't have to virtualize so many registers onto your device. So, yeah. So, is it the time for questions or? Uh, uh, have... It would be better if we take the questions at the end because we have quite a loaded uh, talk and we have a panel at the end. So yeah, I, if we you're would gonna be... go into details. Maybe... Let's yeah, so let's point. let's hold it till the panel because 30 minutes is just for questions. So I would go to the next. 
uh, Sridhar and Pavan, are you are you good to go? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. So, okay. So, yeah, so basically, uh, one of the questions that comes up, right, when we talk about IDPF, along with what I go, there is a question that how is it different from IAVF? Uh, IAVF is our Intel Adaptive Virtual Function Driver that is upstream today. Uh, so, IAVF is, uh, is a common virtual function driver for all our current foundational Linux uh, that use I4TE and IIS as a PF drivers. So on these NICs, right, the virtual function resources are managed by the PF driver and the VF driver uses a control channel between the VF and the PF to do the resource configuration. So that's how I have which is today. But what we are proposing IDPF is, is it is targeted as a vendor agnostic standard driver for all the for our future IPUs and uh, future foundation mix. Uh, unlike IAVF, this is a common driver for both the physical functions as well as the virtual functions that are exposed to the host by the device. The, uh, so in this model, the host PF and VF driver resources are managed by a control plane that is running on the device. And so they don't go, yeah, it is not by the PF is not the one that is managing. It is some control plane that is running on the device is managing the resources. And the host drivers talk to this device over a control channel using uh, the new word channel 2 API uh, for learning and negotiating the capabilities and to do the resource configuration. And also this control channel is also used for event notifications uh, from the device to the driver such as uh, when bringing up the link up or down and also to indicate the device reset events. Okay, Anjali, can you move to the next slide? So, yeah, so what is new in the IPF driver and the new control channel API? Okay. So, the, the, it, uh, it is using basically, we have made the neck, capability negotiation much more granular. So by exposing the device capabilities uh, to reflect the device features, and also it can be based on a policy that is configured for a particular instance. And that is all controlled by the control plane running on the device. So for example, let us say if, uh, the checksum offloads can be learned and negotiated at a much granular level. For example, whether the device supports generic checksum or the protocol-specific checksum and within protocol-specific checksum, what are the protocols that are supported? So those, those are can be negotiated. And similarly, the segmentation of load uh, capabilities also are negotiated at uh, the generic, whether it is generic segmentation of load or the uh, protocol-specific, all this can be negotiated. And for the RSS, we can negotiate the flow fields that are used for the uh, doing the RSS. And similarly, the receive side coalescing or the Linux call system hardware GRO. So that is also uh, can be negotiated. And similarly, the header split boundaries also can be negotiated, whether the header split happens at the L2 level, at the L3 or the L4. So all are negotiated and then the number of v ports so the v port is a uh, from a linux software point of view a v port can be considered as a net dev that is exposed to the uh, user by the driver so so we can negotiate how many v ports that a particular instance can create so that is also uh, is learned as part of the uh, Negoti capability negotiation. So this is mainly to enable actually uh, exposing a default net dev as well as we can uh, expose additional net devs using the for to enable sub functions that can be given to containers. So that is also possible. And then the number of queues that can be given to the V ports and the interrupt vectors. Okay. And then the even the device register offsets. And the descriptor formats uh, also we have made it such a way that this can be learned from the device rather than hard coding it in the driver so even if the device changes uh, in future 
it can the offsets and the descriptive formats are also negotiated. Uh, Sorry, I have a question. Can you explain what do you mean by learning descriptive formats? Does it mean that every vendor can use their own descriptive format and somehow the driver figures it out? Uh, let me yeah, ask so that one. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so basically what we are saying is we are going to define an ID for the each of the descriptor formats and the driver learns the descriptor IDs and the descript each ID corresponds to a specific format. So that way we can support multiple descriptor formats. Uh, so uh, Boris, basically, you know, there is a device control plane on the other side of the device and that is per vendor device control plane. As long as you uh, match the protocol that we are talking uh, from the driver, you can uh, definitely add new descriptor formats, um, you know, but if you are, for the base features that we're uh, kind of standardizing, you may have to go with the standard uh, descriptor formats that are defined. Unless you say, okay, I'm not going to even support the base features. I am going to invent my own features. Then you can design your own descriptor format. See, so, so I assume this is the same for completions. Uh, uh, so for us, we uh, definitely have received completions are definitely something you negotiate your descriptor formats you transmit transmit work submissions you have that on the descriptor completion for like say transmit or uh, you know your buffer submission to your device those are pretty standard because there's not so much of uh, information in there so uh, yeah we can talk about it there are, there are quite a few Okay, I'm low on battery here. So um, we we have quite a few descript, uh, you know, negotiation uh, features built into the driver, and we can look into it. Uh, definitely something which will which has room for for uh, enhancement as well. For uh, the basic features, yeah, it makes sense to support only one format, but. Uh, still need some room for vendors to absolutely that. so yeah so like the descriptor there's one field that is fixed in the descriptor which is the descriptor id and that is like you know five bit or i believe on the transmit and the receive side and so there's a lot of room there for you to come up with your own descriptor format in fact i think we are using um, no more than seven or eight right now so there's a lot of room there um, Here's a proposal. Why not make Viltio the baseline uh, descriptor and completion format? And then everybody can learn their own uh, alternative. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, Michael Freskin will talk about. IDPF is uh, was an approach that we kind of, uh, in order to have the speed to produce something that is uh, optimized for the hardware, we didn't want to start from Word.io because we know it is not optimized for uh, hardware. Uh, but yeah, you want to have a combined driver between Word.io and IDPF. I don't think that is going to be a problem. So we can talk about that. that. I, I know you want to get faster, but I think this is the simple question, right? Because if we're saying that the driver is going to I know we want to get past this and hit the, the milestones, but this is the central question, right? Like if, if basically the device model, which is queues, descriptor formats, operational model completions are being described. And I know what this looks like. It looks very similar to an IPU's internal design. Um, and everybody else is being told conform to this. That's going to be very hard, right? Because there may be something very simple, like I have, a, I have a NIC that has a 96 bit address because I put metadata in there. If that's not in the in the base descriptor, I'm done. I cannot participate. So- No, that's where I'm saying that it is not true. So first of all- No, no, when, base, I'm saying if, if you say- so, that, so base is also negotiated. Okay. It's not fixed. That, that point, then you're just, the so, only thing you're- it, <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, so I mean, 
Yeah, you, 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 you can uh, decide one way or the other. You either confirm to what has been defined and then, you know, you, you have a very simple driver or you say, okay, no, I want to do, you know, RSC, you know, very different than what is defined point, in the base the set. So I want my format in the base driver. Otherwise, there is no point. Right. So, so you add it in the base driver. But uh, what I meant is even the base features are negotiated. So you can say, I don't support RSC format one. I support RSC format so, two. So you get a different descriptor. If that's the case. Then the, the driver will look like it has chunks of each vendor. Doesn't and make and and sense. and. Yeah, so I mean, this is like the choice. The, the Linux kernel this the is, solution. This is, IDPF. this is exactly the choice that you have to make whether we keep this driver simple by adhering to one format that has been optimized, so, uh, or we say, no, we, we how, have something that is already defined. So I'll add my own descriptor format. How is this different than the current uh, Linux kernel? It has all the drivers, all the formats. That's the IDPF they're looking for. So. Okay. I have another proposal. How about we inject a BPF oh. uh, function from the hypervisor to the VM to do Very the nice. description formatting? I have a different proposal. Can we use Rust? Yeah. <laughs> I need power because I, I yeah, my machine died. My Intel machine didn't like your question. <laughs> Any more comments? Yeah. Yeah. Something the, the, has to be standardized. You know, there well, is. There the, is. The problem is definitely. the graphics community already did this ages ago. They did a yeah, class-based driver, and then that becomes your baseline. Yep. But the problem is that's your baseline. No performance. It's bare graphics, VGA, that's all you're going to get. Yep. If you want to get fancy, then you have to lo go load the vendor driver. And that kind of gets back to what's being said here. Is I, I think we're going to be challenged if we're going to say that the ID, I, IDPF is going to be the only one driver for any one of these IDPF devices. Because you're going to end up ha having all the vendors cramming everything into it. So yeah. Just, so, I mean, we have uh, things that got standardized. And BME is a good example. So... Okay. <laughs> well, sorry. Brief, brief uh, reminder that we're like we're way over time. Thanks for all these questions. Uh, which questions are good? Discussions good. Um, but uh, I think uh, we need to wrap up this talk and keep the other ones pretty brief as well. Yeah. Thanks, Willem. So uh, you know, if uh, uh, Sridhar or Pavan, you want to continue and share the slide deck, I am having a little bit of a, a power issue well, here. Yeah. So go ahead and share. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, so do you see my screen now? Okay, so do you see my screen now? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. So yeah, actually, let me quickly go complete. Yeah, this one is just talking about the other the the new features that are supported by the IDPF driver, the split queue model where we can have uh, it allows a large number of queues with reduced post memory footprint. Basically, you can have a fewer number of buffer queues where you post the buffers and uh, you can have a large number of completion queues. And uh, this limits the overall number of receive buffers and we can reuse them quickly. It helps with the cache utilization and the host memory utilization. And uh, the split queue model also allows a single writer for each of the queue to minimize the write conflicts. So because the receive buffer queues are software write and the completion queues are hardware write. And also to support header split, the driver can post uh, dual buffers in each descriptor. I think this is a header split feature. OK, and we have this concept called receive buffer queue groups. So where we can have uh, a buffer queue group can have one or two buffer queues. 
and each buffer queue can hold uh, buffers of different sizes. So one of the buffer queue can hold, uh, let us say, 2K, and the other buffer queue can hold 4K buffers. And this is mainly used for the GRO or the RSC use case, where uh, if the device uh, finds that the next packet is going, can be coalesced, it uses uh, picks a larger buffer. And if it is a regular packet, it can pick the smaller buffer. So that is also possible. And then the, to the per flow QoS or uh, EDT feature that allows uh, packet pacing where the, uh, the stack or the upper layer can specify the timestamp and the, it can be offloaded to hardware to uh, delay the uh, packet transmission based on the timestamp set in the packet. And in order to support this, we need out of order transmit uh, completions to be supported in the driver, and that is also uh, the, uh, possible in the uh, supported in the IDPF driver. Okay, and then the receive segment coalescing is another feature. I think this is a hardware GRO. It is supported by multiple vendors, and the IDPF also supports this feature. Okay, so let us move on to the next slide. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is just a slide that is showing the sequence of control channel messages that are sent by the driver to the control plane uh, to bring up the driver and uh, expose a net device that can be used for the uh, TX and RX. Uh, yeah, so this we have made this very generic so that uh, it can be supported by multiple devices, any device. So starts with the get capabilities and allocate vectors, create reports, and then configuring the TXRX queues, mapping the queues to the vectors, configuring the RSS, enable queues, and enable report. So these sequence of messages just bring up the driver and the net device. OK, so yeah, I think I will pass it on to Pawan. He will talk about the go into more details about the device idpf device and control plane interaction and also uh, talk about hardware gro uh, so yeah uh, thanks Shreda. so now we look into uh, how the interaction that happens between the idpf and the device control plane so i'll take an example of a create report uh, uh, message so yeah, when the driver uh, wants to create a report, it will uh, internally call IDPFs and create report message. Uh, it will build the structure with you know uh, all the uh, resources that it needs, and uh, then it will send a message to the control plane. Uh, here uh, you can see the uh, uh, we are using like a virtual to op create report, and uh, once the message is sent uh, to the uh, control plane, uh, the uh, thread goes to sleep and it wakes up only uh, when there is a time of a timeout or uh, when the uh, message is received from the other side yeah on the control plane like uh, it process the message it will uh, allocate the resources uh, that the driver asked and it will uh, send back uh, the response to the driver so yeah we are using a control queue uh, which is interrupt driven so uh, once uh, the event is received uh, we get an interrupt and we process the message uh, so once the message is processed the uh, uh, waiting or the sleeping thread uh, gets waked up here so yeah here uh, now the vport is created on the other side and uh, we continue with you know uh, creating the vport process uh, on the driver so this is uh, uh, quick question uh, mm -hmm. this this channel the control queue that's also a, a device specification right no it is not actually this is a virtual uh, you know it's built on a data queue just like you know the mm -hmm. the simple data queue that is used for packet transfer and all the stuff that is defined on top of it is a protocol sim you know that is again this is a discussion that we can have this is what we are proposing this yeah, is a just, soft just, protocol but it isn't right because there is an expectation of the back end channel that has to exist like unless you're saying there's a driver below the driver that is going to go interact with that device so the specification in the device is only for the tmaq 
yeah, which, which is, is a, a mailbox. Which is a device. But on top of that, we run virtual descriptive formats. That's fine. But and, and those are defined in software between the control plane that is soft and the sure, device. Sure, but that, is, that, that does require that every other device that has got a DPU or some embedded core. Yeah, has so that you, DMA you have to have a transport, uh, you know, the DMA a, channel. A, a open DMA channel transport. Correct. You can't have a different transport because that doesn't. Yes. Work. Yeah, it's, it's a. It's a 32 byte descriptor, you know, uh, head right back yeah. with the descriptor that is completely defined based on whatever protocol you run. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, the interaction uh, that happens between the driver and the control plane. And this uh, will be, uh, you know, similar for all the other uh, outputs what Sri are mentioned. Uh, next slide, Sri. Yeah, so now we'll look into uh, uh, one of the uh, feature, uh, RSC, and what are the steps that uh, gets involved in, on the driver and, uh, uh, when, and and also when we enable this feature. So first of all, uh, the driver uh, requests the feature uh, in the get, get capabilities uh, to the control plane, and control plane will uh, either disable or enable the feature. So yeah, once we create a net device and uh, we uh, you know advertise the features to the stack, we see whether the capability is enabled or not, and based on that, we you know go ahead and uh, uh, turn on turn on the native FGRO hardware. So uh, in this case, let's assume the uh, feature is uh, disabled by default, and uh, we give the knob to the user to turn it on via ETH tool. So when the user uh, turns it on, uh, we get a call back into the driver using NDO set features, which internally calls uh, initiate soft reset in the driver. Uh, basically, we bring down all the resources and uh, we configure uh, the RxQ context with the RSC you know, flag enabled in this case. And we bring up all the resources back again. So yeah, these are the opcodes and uh, uh, these are the messages that uh, basically flow uh, when we turn on uh, uh, the hardware GR feature here. Uh, next slide, Shri. I don't know, my screen is kind of slow. I uh, assume like uh, it went to the next slide. So yes. yeah, uh, just a second. So, okay, yeah, I see it now. So here, as Sridhar explained in the previous slides, uh, so uh, we use like large buffers to support the RSC feature. And uh, here the device uses 16 uh, buffers max. That means like we get a max payload of 64K uh, co-list packet. So yeah, once uh, the feature is enabled and uh, uh, the driver is you know, ready to receive the co-list segments, uh, uh, it starts receiving the you know, RSC packets. And uh, that will be, you know, informed uh, to the driver in the descriptor whether it is an RSC packet or not. If yes, uh, we'll get, uh, you know, the RSC segment length. And uh, based on the data length and the segment length, we calculate the number of segments and we update certain fields uh, in the SKB so that the stacks under stack understands like uh, how to, you know, decode the RSC uh, packet here. Uh, so yeah. So this is uh, one of the feature, how we turn it on. And uh, uh, I think yeah, similar uh, steps will be followed for other features too. I think uh, that's all on the hardware, on the driver initialization and the uh, interaction between the uh, driver and the device control plane. Uh, now I'll pass it on to JP and Yeni. All right. Thanks, Pavan. All right, my name is Shay Prakash. Um, I have my colleague really with me. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about um, uh, what is host management agent, why do we need it, and how does it help enable the config path. A couple of flows. One is basic, and the other one is advanced. Uh, next slide, please, Anjali. OK, let's start with uh, what is the HME. Uh, HME uh, is host management agent. Before we talk about uh, the details of the HME, let's focus on the picture on the left. So we have uh, host on the upper side and device on the bottom side. And then we do have a separation of control path and the data path. This is the separation that Anjali talked about. So the control path is where um, the HME comes into play. As you can see on the host side, we have uh, 
different types of functions it can be physical function, virtual function, API sub function, and so on. IDPF will be the single driver that will be operating on all these different functions. Uh, and then on the device side, uh, we do have the hardware blocks that are implementing the queues, vectors, the offloads, packet processing engine, and so on. So somehow you need to get access to these resources and configure them before the fast path can take over and start exchanging the packets. So that is where the HMA comes into play. On the device control plane, we have um, the HMA running either in the user mode or in the kernel mode. And then uh, the HMA will uh, configure uh, a mailbox queue for each of those host functions. And then uh, once the driver is ready, uh, it can uh, you know, um, uh, enable this mailbox queue and start exchanging the word channel messages that we have defined in the IDPF spec. Right, so that's the whole idea. Now, um, thanks, Anjali. So why do we need it? Right, so we already talked about this. So it's it's it, it's going to enable the split between the control path and the data path. And um, uh, the device implements a lot of resources. And it is practically impossible to expose all those CSRs into the bar space of the host functions. So we need some channel to request these resources. And that channel uh, happens to be the mailbox in our case. And the mailbox is very simple. It implements you know, like handful of registers. Everything else is implemented as a payload uh, in terms of the word channel messages to negotiate and configure the resources. The HMA also uh, follows the client server model. So in the IPU case, the device is owned by the infrastructure. And the resources are owned by the infrastructure provider. And so um, it is easy for the IPU provider to provision uh, as long as the provisioning policies are maintained in one uh, single repository. In this case, it happens to be the HMA. And so the infrastructure provider can distribute the resources according to the provisioning policies. And these policies can be uh, you know, either locally stored inside the file system of the IPU, or it can be downloaded from, uh, you know, an orchestration agent outside of the host, and so on. Um, so, in addition to that, uh, the HMA promotes the reuse of the host driver because we are standardizing the host interface, and uh, you know, the implementation of the virtual messages are in in the HMA. So. Um, uh, it uh, it does promotes the reuse of the host driver. Uh, not only that, it does promotes the reuse of the driver across the silicons. Right, it could be multiple generations, or or you know, could even be uh, across multiple vendors. And um, uh, the HMA is not necessarily uh, have to be the implementation provided by by Intel. It can be implemented by anyone. Next slide, please, Anjali. Okay, so this slide, we're going to talk about how the HMA is initialized on the IPU side. So uh, this is using the user mode implementation of HMA. So, um, you know, we use the VFIO uh, to start composing the user mode device of the IPF. IPF is the, uh, um, uh, the, um, the function that gets exposed inside the IPU that has access to all the hardware resources that ASIC implements. And so uh, we compose the user mode device and bar, map the bar resources into the virtual address space of the process. And, and once we have uh, access to the underlying hardware, uh, it is going to initialize its own end of the mailbox, which is the parent mailbox. And at that point, uh, the HME will go ahead and allocate a queue pair for every uh, host function and it's going to configure uh, the mailbox queue in its predefined location. Um, and um, the queues will have its own rate limits. Um, and then the queues are enabled uh, before the functions are um, released from the reset. So on the driver side, the driver will still be waiting until the reset gets cleared. And when the reset gets cleared, uh, it does know that there is already a mailbox available for its usage in its own bar space. So it's going to configure um, that mailbox as a generic ring, it's a regular ring uh, by uh, building the descriptor ring and all that. 
And at that point, uh, the driver can freely exchange uh, the virtual messages um, that are defined in the IDPF spec and HMA will start handling those requests and, and each virtual message will be translated to multiple CSR accesses from uh, the HMA side. Right, next slide, please. All right, so this is the basic flow uh, that creates the vPort. As Sridhar pointed out, vPort is essentially a NetDAO in the next. So it's the L2 endpoint. So the driver, uh, when it um, is ready to uh, create the NetDAOs, it is going to interact with the HMA to create the vPort on the hardware side. And then on the hardware side, uh, the HMA is going to allocate the hardware resources that are needed for this vPort. Uh, so it could be the VSIs or data queues, LUT, uh, instances, and so on. Right. And then um, the HMA will also uh, generate the MAC addresses and can it can ask the filter agent to program the MAC addresses so that the packets can be routed to the appropriate VSIs. And all these uh, resource information will be sent back to the driver. And now the driver has technically configured all the hardware that is necessary to register the NetDev, and the NetDev can, uh, you know, um, uh, start uh, receiving the traffic. So that is that is the point when the driver will go ahead and register the NetDev with the kernel, and the IDPF uh, interface shows up on the host side. So the key uh, point to note here is this is the same flow not just for the PF, but it is the same flow for PF, PF, and SAOV and all that. And uh, the footprint in order to enable all these net devices on the host side is very less because we are converging on the mailbox queue to configure the resources and uh, not relying on the CSR uh, direct accesses uh, from the host into the uh, silicon. Right. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I invite Priya Lee to talk about the packet tracing and the traffic sharing here. Yeah, thanks, JP. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, one of the advanced feature IDPF support, traffic shipping or uh, EDT. Um, so IDPF driver supports EDT hardware offload uh, for devices which supports traffic shipping. EDT stands for earliest departure time and uh, packet have timestamp uh, and packet can be transmitted only once uh, the timestamp is reached or expired. Usually congestion control algorithm or pacing uh, algorithm running in the networking stack put the timestamp in the packet. Uh, to support EDT, uh, yeah, so, uh, I can't see the slides. Can you go on you the, go to the slide, slide number 24? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thank you. So to support EDT uh, device uh, should have uh, some capability like uh, device should have support to store packet headers, packet metadata, and uh, associated uh, scatter gather list in somewhere in memory. And uh, device should also be capable to understand the timestamp in the SKB and hold the packet until uh, it reaches the departure time. And yes, device should understand the uh, timestamp uh, and uh, it should be synchronized uh, with the, uh, uh, the time uh, should be synchronized with the host time, which is sending the packet. Since a uh, device holds the uh, pack uh, data transmission in the memory, uh, order of packet descriptor fetch may be different than order uh, than packet data fetch. So device need to support uh, out of order completion uh, of packet data. To support out of order, uh, IDP, uh, IDPF driver uh, uses a split queue model. And uh, um, so device also should have a split queue model supported. Device that supports the split queue model uh, should have uh, 
two cues for transmission. Uh, one tran uh, where one uh, trans uh, transmit queue are used to pass buffer from software to hardware, and other transmit queue, which we call transmit completion queue, are used to get the completion from hardware to uh, software. And uh, these completion queue uh, can get two type of notification, uh, two type of completion notification. One once when descriptor, uh, descriptor fetch is completed, and another one when uh, data fetch is completed. Uh, so since packet is hold in the de uh, device, uh, descriptor fetch completion may come early. And based on this early notification for descriptor fetch completion, uh, TXQ slot can be freed, and these freed uh, slots uh, can be used for the next packet request. And uh, uh, the completion notification can have the uh, timestamp, which can actually tell us that um, at which time packet was actually transmitted. Uh, it may be beyond the uh, TX timestamp, which was uh, originally in the SKB because of some delay or some other thing. So these, uh, this uh, actual transmit timestamp, which is in the completion, can be used as a feedback, uh, and it, uh, it can be sent up to networking stack or uh, congestion control algorithm to adjust its pacing rate uh, or uh, other QoS parameter. So uh, in the previous slide, uh, uh, there was a link um, which talks uh, more about uh, shaping and traffic shaping and pacing, how it is used and how networking stack is adopting this model um, uh, for pacing. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so, um, device may have uh, may have different type of uh, time stamping related parameter, uh, which is specific to device like the granularity and uh, time range for which packet can be stored in the memory because memory is limited, so it cannot store all the packet in the memory. Um, so we are defining a time range uh, in the device for which packet can be stored, and it's. Uh, just for example, it's called overflow threshold. So device control plane configures these device specific parameter. And uh, then once driver comes up, these parameter are communicated to driver uh, via mailbox. Uh, next slide, please. OK, thank you. Um, so once networking stack sends the packet, which has uh, transmit time in it, um, driver can check if this uh, the timestamp in the packet is beyond uh, that overflow threshold, then it marks the packet as a overflow packet and sends to device. And device is, uh, since it's overflow device, schedules it at the end of the current threshold range. And uh, then <clears throat> this packet is transmitted once current threshold has been reached. Otherwise, uh, if uh, packet timestamp, packet TX time uh, is still under, uh, under uh, threshold range, it's uh, the timestamp is translated into the granularity which device understand and packet is posted to device, device schedules the packet based on the TX timestamp and holds in the memory. Once it reaches that uh, TX timestamp, packet is transmitted. Yeah, next slide, please. Probably, uh, let's wrap up soon. I think we are. Yeah, OK. Planning. So this slide is talking about out of order flow. Uh, like earlier, I explained it, it, this is required. Uh, in this example, uh, there are three packet which reaches at the same time, but have different timestamp uh, 40, 30, and 45. All these three packets are under the threshold uh, because 
in this example, threshold is 50. So you can see that uh, uh, descriptor fetch completion uh, came at the same time for all these three packets, but data fetch completion uh, came at different time according to uh, their DX time because it was hold in the it was scheduled by device uh, in the uh, according to their TX timestamp. Uh, yeah, that's all for me. Thanks, Preli. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. Thank you, Anjali. Um, so yeah, it will be uh, very quick on the PTP side. Um, uh, PTP, as we all know, it is one of the very critical features. Um, uh, that's being requested on the network devices, uh, uh, mainly for 5G and all uh, other applications. Um, of course, this is IPU, the IPU world. Uh, we may use it in different uh, uh, use cases. Uh, here, I, I will mainly touch on um, the standardization portion. I will not really go into uh, too many technical details on how PTP is implemented and all. Uh, so uh, the main things, uh, what we are, uh, how it is standardized is uh, so the any uh, the syncing with the grandmaster, the network device if, uh, clock um, syncing to the grandmaster is all done inside the device. Uh, it is not exposed to the host. Uh, that is one of the key uh, things. Um, uh, the second one is uh, uh, on the host. Uh, the host will have only the access uh, to a few registers uh, through which it can uh, sync to the uh, host uh, clock. It can sync to the device clock by reading the device clock. So uh, host will be having only the read access uh, to the device clock, uh, no write access. Uh, that is uh, the second main point. Uh, the third one is uh, VM. VM does not have any access to the device clock. Uh, at least in um, some of the uh, devices. Uh, uh, so in future, maybe we, uh, we may think about it uh, to give access to some of the, so to give access to some device registers to VM. But at least uh, uh, the idea is VM has to sync to the host uh, through uh, hypervisor or chemo, uh, chemo um, interfaces. Uh, so uh, th that's the, uh, that's the gist of that uh, the slide, uh, mainly three points. Um, uh, the device clock to grandmaster is all done inside the device. Host will have read access to the device clock uh, so that it can sync. And VM, uh, it will sync to the host through hypervisor or chemo, no device involved. Yeah. Uh, the uh, yeah coming to the uh, main device registers, uh, what we have for PTP. Uh, so it's all about uh, three registers: um, um, shadow time, uh, L and uh, lower and higher. Uh, so the API that is used is uh, uh, get time sixty four. This is mainly the PTP callback, uh, PTP stack stack callback. It's a standard callback uh, as which we all know. And then uh, the other, uh, and this is mainly to read the timestamp from the driver uh, and uh, from the device. Uh, then uh, if, if, the, if the device is, if the platform is supporting PTM, uh, then uh, we also have, uh, we will also be supporting the get cross uh, timestamp. And there uh, you have additional registers, uh, uh, ART registers, uh, so that you can have the, uh, you can have the snapshot of your system clock and then the device clock exactly at the same time uh, to avoid any um, uh, jitters or anything. Uh, uh, so uh, that, that's the, that's basically the interface to the device, uh, a few registers uh, uh, to sync to the device clock. Done, Anjali. Thanks, Fani. Um, I think it's Jing Jing. Jing Jing. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, besides the kernel driver, IDBF can also be uh, taken by user space. So we have implemented an IDPF user space driver. So it is based on VFIO framework. 
and to demonstrate the uh, high performance of the IDPF, so uh, we developed that in the um, based on DPTK. So <clears throat> it is the poly mode and with some typical optimizations, such like uh, core affinity, memory efficient uh, uh, management, and uh, some platform features. And next page. Angela, next page. Yeah, so uh, to to make sure the device be controlled by user space driver, so at the initial lifetime, so first uh, <clears throat> we need to we need uh, three FDs to control uh, make the uh, make the device to be exposed to user space. So one is the container, another is IOM group, the next one is the device. At the initialized time, uh, first set IMU type through the container FD. Uh, secondly, uh, get IMU group FD and uh, add it to container. Uh, then do the DMA mapping with uh, allocated uh, huge pages. At last, uh, get a region in uh, through the device FD and uh, and map bar to the user space. After uh, the internalization, user space IDPF driver can access the device uh, like uh, uh, the next page. So for bar access, uh, using uh, mapped, ma ma mapped address plus the register offset defined in the uh, IDPF spec. Uh, for DMA, uh, based on DBDK memory pool management, allocate uh, and free and buff from the uh, DMA above memory. For virtual channel message handling, uh, we set up the uh, control queue, mailbox, and uh, use uh, timer based polling way to uh, deal with the message sending and the response. The uh, last important part is about the uh, fast pass ring setup and the uh, receive and the transmit functions. Allocate hardware from the DMA memory. Uh, use virtual channel to ask resource and set up it. In receive uh, and the transmit uh, um, pass. Uh, allocate and free um, buffer from the DMA ball memory by memory memory pool management. And uh, at the same time, tail needed to be updated through uh, some MM MMIO, right? Uh, I think later let, can let, let Dan to present the performance number. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, um... We're just going to go over the performance numbers really quickly. Um, one thing to kind of note is that these are initial results. Um, we do expect them to improve. Um, and also, this is not, this is the DPTK driver like Xinjiang was talking about. And so not um, the IDPF driver itself. But this is going to give us some baseline of our hardware, what the hardware can actually do. Um, um, the, this is this slide here is talking about um Jinjin kind of already covered it so we can probably go on to the next one um this is our the actual test um configuration of the um dd um dpdk commands the, um some of the important things in this one is we're using a traffic generator that's running at 100% of line rate. Um, and in the last system slide, it also, the system is not going to be our bottleneck. So sort of the basic stuff you would expect. Um, and uh, the next slide actually gives us the meat of the results. This is for single queue performance. Um, the, a couple things to call out here is that we're getting line rate with a single queue, single thread on one core um, at roughly 256 
packets. Um, we they back off a little bit for single queue after that, um, but uh, we get up to um, 200 gig relatively quickly. Um, and, and once again, this is for this is the legacy single queue um, queuing mechanism, like Srihar talked about earlier. Um, the next slide talks about um, our um, multi the multi queue approach, and this isn't quite. You mean um, the split queue? Split queue. Thank you. I was reading the top. <laughs> um, uh, this this slide is we get pretty similar performance. It's not quite as good. Um, that is due to DPDK being um, optimized for single queue currently. Um, we may be able to change that to get some better performance than what we're seeing now. But once again, it's the same type of thing. Um, uh, at 512, we're getting um, close to line rate across any number of queues. And then it drops off a little bit as we get down to 64 bit packets. But once again, this is just sort of to give you a summary of what our hardware is capable of performing. And uh, yeah. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, OK. Uh, IDPF is intended as a vendor neutral device interface that provides a single network interface that provides a single net interface for hosts, containers, and guests. IDPF device can be present to an operating system as a PCIe PF device or a VF device from NIC, or as a community emulated device in host software. Today, we introduced the emulated backend of IDPF, a vendor agnostic software emulated device to provide IDPF compatible layouts. IDPF backend can simulate new hardware future and deploy on multiple vendor environments. One part of hand hardware can, cannot support native IDPF, but unified interface needs to be provided, for instance. OK, go to next page. Traditionally, Qman use VFIO to allow VM to directly access IDPF device by, use, by using system core like left part of picture. Now, like the right part of picture, VFL user protocol allows a device emulation in the in a separate process out of Cuma. The VFL user device consists of a generic VFIO device type living in Cuma, which is called the VFL user client and the core emulated device implementation living outside of Cuma, which is called the VFL user server. With VFL user implementation, emulated device can be removed from Cuma to a user space process. So we implement IDPF backend in DeepDK for high performance. IDPF backend is divided to control plane and data plane. The IDPF control plane is responsible for the device resource management and the device internal logic or specifics of a device except the data path handling is implemented in it. The IDPF data plane is responsible for all data path handling. It uses EMU Dev API mainly for getting device related information from control plane of emulated IDPF device. Okay, go to next page. VFL user, we used the core VFIO concepts defended in its API, but implements them as messages to be sent over socket. These VFL user messages can be sent for device config, config 
device access and the DMA. For the for device config, client sends VFL user device get info message to get device info like region number and the interrupter type number, and then sends VFL user device gets region info and the VFL user device gets LQ info message to query the server for region information and the interrupter type information. VFL user device set LQ message is sent by client to server to set action for device interrupter type. For device access, client read and write on mapped region by sending VFL user region read and VFL user region write message. For DMA, client use VFL user DMA map and the VFL user DMA on map message to inform server of the valid DMA ranges that the server can access. And then the server can use VFL user DMA read and VFL user DMA write message to read and write. Okay, next page. Meow, if you can wrap in three minutes because we need uh, time for the panel. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Go ahead and, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, really conclude if, if possible. Uh, need uh, um, several minutes. Okay. Uh, do you um, want to just go through? to the data plane, uh, slide 46. Uh, so, okay, so data plan, so in IDPF data plan, there is an overall structure named ADAPT, which stores global information of IDPF data plan. ADAPT can have multiple reports, which are implemented as either dev and each report can have many RxQ and TxQ. Rx buffer queue and TX completed queue are created and used only in split queue model. Structure IDPF adopt includes EMU dev. The device ID EMU device info like device type region number and max Q number, DMA memory table, the admin queue in information, uh, what channel version, IDPF reports. Okay, next slice. IDPF data plan provides uh, either DevOps to application for report lifecycle management, like report start, stop, config, and close, report link state updates, and the queue management, like queue state up, release, and info gate. IDPF data plan provides notify ops to IDPF control plan for new device start, destroy, update and reset and uh, dead pass knock knock uh, okay that's all thank you thanks meow um uh Shida, could you stop sharing so michael can share and start the panel all right um let's see and um, share screen <laughs> Just says I'm um what's that? I'm not just doing the screen. Wow. Wow. Um what? Does this work? Yeah, we can we can check. Um I'll just uh just probably. Yeah, so I saw just quickly before we start the open the discussion, um, 
I just did like a quick kind of thought experiment um, to show how we could, uh, like, um, if uh, IDPF wanted to like integrate um, the start of the table, how that could work out. Um, so IDPF is standardizing under this. Um, it's like a separate, just to be a separate TC. Um, uh, if IDPF wanted to be like a part of the same TC, uh, that would be seamless. Uh, if not, OASIS kind of actually encourages to submit any specifications to multiple committees. So that's, uh, that's an option for that. Uh, I'm going to talk about organizational things for a minute at the end. Let me just dive into the technicalities. Um, so this, the IDPF definitely brings a lot of, a lot of new functionality. Um, that the DAO could benefit from. In particular, uh, some of this has actually been worked on under the DAO, like the Snick header support, for example. And so, uh, just just learning from that expertise, looking at it from the outside, that's uh, what's going to happen if IDPF doesn't want to work with the DAO. But we could maybe save you know, a bunch of efforts just, just integrating everything. Uh, together. Uh, just generally, I think uh, it's been discussed under the Tayo mailing list as well that read write memory uh, is what's like expensive for uh, for uh, the memory map. We could have a bunch of read only registers as long as they are identical between all the like, future functions, between all some functions of the device. They don't really matter much, it's most, mostly an address decoder. That's pretty cheap. Um, so this more or less means that we could have all of the all of the complex like uh, layout that the TIO likes to present to the driver in order to like, describe all of the functionality and capability of the device, and it should be it should be expensive to present as long as it's read only, but. For writable, uh, we definitely want to, to switch to something like a uh, uh, Vibq transfer. There's actually a proposal for Vibq transfer under the Tayon. And um, on top of that, we will want something very minimal to like configure setup of this, this Vibq. This is something that the Tayon is working on right now. And we could maybe look at like, like incorporating uh, the layout from IDPF. If that makes sense for us. Um, the DAO supports multiple descriptor formats right now, it supports two. So, definitely adding extra information um, in the descriptor will obviously save some of these extra language. And uh, this is something we probably should look at anyway. Again, just learning uh, is one option, and of course. Uh, just just sharing would be even better. Separate separate post on completion is not something that IO currently knows how to do. I think it would be useful especially for things like RDMA. And uh, and uh, uh, without as an abstraction of a virtue, which kind of just generally talks about buffers being available and unused. So it sh I think it should fit under that abstraction. Um, but without doing that work, it's hard to say. Um, what would IDPF gain from that? Um, I think we're, there's a bunch of like experience um, on extensibility and how uh, all, all the negotiation works out. And I think that's um, been like the making features of orthogonal to each other is something that the DAO has a lot of experience with and um, could be useful for NDPF as well. Lots of things um, even that IDPF is using are actually kind of generic and might be used for various device types. So um, the DAO already supports a bunch of device types. So if we kind of generalize some things, then we could, we could down the road, say, all right, I actually want the storage device which uses queues that look like IDPF queues, and, and you get that functionality. 
uh, for virtual machines, sometimes you want to present a virtual PC device, but sometimes you don't. So uh, the value option has an MMI or binding. So that's an extra option if, if you become like, uh, kind of want to create this, this material. And um, a bunch of a bunch of other transfers people are talking about it more. And drivers from multiple platforms, like if you look standard I.O., it's kind of easy for people to add a yet another virtual format, get a bunch of features, and you gain that. Um, and I really want kind of worry a little bit about uh, the, the theft of, of the community. We suddenly have two specifications, like kind of, kind of overlap a little bit, and um, um, it, I think it would be easier for people if they could say, "All right, let's let's just um, let's just integrate everything, have like one huge stack that covers everything." Um, how would, so? How would we make that work if there was a world? Uh, so. We already have a bunch of features, we could have a bunch more that say, all right, this different descriptive format, this different uh, way to configure devices. So that at least one step that we shouldn't be provided. It's hard to say up front whether like, trying to also support with IO and ADPF on the same driver will make, make, make things harder. Um, but I guess we could always say, all right, we have like, depending on the features, uh, we have these huge sets of features. And if you have this set of features within the IO, then you call it an IDPF device, and then you need a lot of that optimized driver. People have been talking about groups of features, actually, like, that kind of play well together for a while. And it, it might be interesting, I think. Um, what about like support for existing IDPF in that? Like there's also interest in, you know, in, in, in supporting in the stack for existing hardware. So when the Tayo evolved, it had like the pre pre oasis times and it, it was that was a 0 0.9 specification. And we like have separate chapters that talk about all right, if, if you want that legacy support, you go there, that, that's how you do that. And we can see something like this being made for like other other device types where you say, all right, you want the new interface, and you can also have also support for for the existing hardware, and then you can have like a generic driver that can drive both. So we could do something like this. Um, if there was a way to just work as part of the entire scene. That, that's one option. I am not sure why not. Um, assuming like this, this feeling that just just starting first work on a stack that's not involving with at all, and then looking at integrating things um, works better for people. I guess that's understandable. Or is it unfortunate that people doesn't have a structure that allows for like some communities? But I think just just if if it will teach you have a charter that says, all right, we want to allow everything here to also be used under the IO and then they like, just have everyone under T C also like a non voting member under the IO T C so information flows both ways. Then that's kind of an equivalent I think. And that's all I have to say. So that was the only channel for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Based on the talk we had just a little while earlier about trying to standardize on just basic feature sets, I think this is jumping way too far ahead in things. You know, we're talking RDMA and stuff, and it's like, no, 
we are not ready for RDMA yet. We need to get consistent about basic features. Like if you wanted to find a descriptor, we need to you know start there. Go for like one or two cues. Don't think about performance, just basic. I wanna be able to do something like a network class driver with this. Not, I want to have all my features in performance. Because the problem is, as soon as you start going into features and performance, it becomes an issue where the first time an Intel NIC introduces a regression that has to be worked around, what do we do? Do we allow the, everyone to take that penalty? Or do we have to kick Intel out of its own driver? And based off of what I've seen in the past with DPDK, so, uh, you know, yeah, I wouldn't let me want answer. to deal with that. So we do have what I own at, which is a generic interface used by lot of people, a lot of uh, device vendors implementing it, uh, NVIDIA and Intel. So somehow we have managed to, you know, fall in line to support a descriptor format, queue, whatever way we have, in, you know, done it. We have managed to fall in line. I so, yes, and that's why I'm saying it. Otherwise, I would not be saying it. No, no, but see, so, there, there, there is a, I, I think there's a step back point. I completely agree with Alex's point, right? So you said, NVMe and uh, and I, I'll take your VGA as an example. No graphics card company, and there's some people from a graphics card company here, uh, would ever talk about their VGA driver as like their frontline device. It isn't. It's a boot device, but it gets you off the ground. And, right. and I think that's Alex's point. Right. NVMe is a completely bad analogy because NVMe had four commands to to issue and two ways to do SGLs, and that's what they standardized and said everybody else manage the control plane the same way, do the discovery the same way, connect to fabrics the same way, and do the same thing. Nix, and specifically, if you try to combine RDMA and Nix, there are 10,000 ways of doing things. We have some, I have vested interest, like many of the descriptor formats you use are, I would say, extremely inefficient compared to more efficient models. And if you impose that in the design, then you're imposing a requirement on the hardware that's underneath. Now, you, we can say, and I think we can say that make all the descriptors and queue formats configurable. But I think that firstly misses Alex's test of have we gone out of the blocks, number one. Number two, uh, actually there are four points. Number two, there's a bunch of functional requirements that Intel has even IP around that you will now have to actually put on the table because anybody else who's going to implement that will either violate the IP or, or not implement it. Number three, the next problem that you're going to run into is that you're going to um, you're going to have this situation where if I'm going to try and implement something that is functionally different, I'm going to have to go extend your driver, the, the IDPF driver, because I cannot do it any other way. And at the end of the day, like once you've gotten all of this going and you've gotten all the functionality done, things like RDMA and, and standard NIC are so diverse in the functionality and like uh, Or had this question, he asked a couple of times, and it's obviously very important, he gets an answer, uh, is when you say RDMA, do you mean Rocky or iWarp? And you said it's non-transport -trans non or transport agnostic. But uh, the question is still valid because there are requirements of Rocky that actually feed through that you will have to be able to provide. If it's iWarp, it's a whole different ball game because then you have to have MPA and all that other crap that shows up on the side. So the question I think becomes, is there functional proof first that two devices from completely disparate architectures could actually meet at this, uh, in this sort of new format? And, and before we get off of that, uh, one more point, because that was the question I think that uh, I wanted to ask um, Sherkin, because I think the place he was going was to say, take Vertio as it is and enhance it with all the things that IDPF is actually proposing. And I think that meets your last ten sentence as well, which is, but I know it has seen agreement. The reality is that it's also been out for a decade before hardware people could move to it. And that if you say, it, let's wait 10 years, I think no one will object, right? <laughs> so um, so the question is, can is it really a, an extension or is there like a complete breakdown that needs to happen? And the part that we haven't talked about is something that Willem touched upon, which is, distributed control, because that's the one place where Tayo today doesn't work with. Multi-host, multi-endpoint, you have to have something that is different from today. Okay, uh, so um, I don't remember the order of questions, <laughs> but I'll try to answer as many as I remember. Yeah, exactly. I was like, should Jeet stop? Now let me answer this one. Okay, so uh, 
right so the rdma part right so rdma part uh, definitely you know we uh, are uh, still kind of you know keeping it out of the spec for now because of the reasons as we all know that there is a lot of diversity there and we need to agree that you know uh, what we standardize makes sense um, and you know making it transport agnostic you know it can be challenging in some cases and that's the part that you know we'll get to it and it is going to be part of the OSS DC charter itself to kind of, you know, have all the parties, um, you know, involved in designing the RDMA side of the uh, the interface so that, you know, all the voices are heard and we have something as a community we can agree on. Now, getting back to have we agreed on something as a community? I mean, we were forced to agree on what Ionet for a lot of reasons for being in business for, you know, some, some cases and, and, uh, you know, when we implemented that on the hardware side, and I'm sure NVIDIA would agree on the side that it is not the most optimized, uh, you know, hardware interface. And and so we had to do all kinds of things like we had to get, you know, email, uh, uh, embedded, uh, you know, uh, embedded um, uh, cores in there to kind of handle some of the, you know, the config, uh, uh, you know, things, uh, you know, do other translations, descriptive translations, in some cases, you know, bringing the performance way down and not scaling up. Now, what IO has improved over a period of time, there is no doubt about it. And that's what I was showing on the slides. And so if you take just the data path, what we would say IDPF is taking what I 1.1 data path to the next level saying, okay, there are some more optimizations you can do. And, and that's how we are, you know, looking at it now about negotiation of features. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. If we were just making a VGA, make all the features, you know, something that you don't want to comply with. And you say, you know, every feature that is uh, defined by, you know, OCP as required by, you know, the devices, I will implement it slightly differently, different descriptive format, how I do it. I'll get the same behavior, but I'll implement it slightly differently. So, I mean, I can't speak for other device vendors, but what I can speak for is this, that, at least, uh, you know, knowing how people kind of lay out their descriptors, as long as the content that is needed is something that we can agree on, that is exchanged between the device and stuff. Most devices are now capable of kind of laying a descriptive format slightly differently, adhering it to the to the driver's needs rather than, you know, uh, you know, should the checksum end up here on this particular byte or should it end up somewhere else or, you know, something to that extent as long as i mean i'll give a good example of uh specs generic checksum uh when you know tom and alex were involved and stuff if you define or generic segmentation for that matter um partial um is it called the partial segmentation of loader i, I can't remember so just just so partial so as long as you define what you're expecting from the device you know, it's not so much about where on the descriptor it is laid out, but if that is defined very well, we can agree on what is needed from the device in terms of once you're done with the, you know, um, uh, what you're sending to the device or what you're receiving from the uh, device on the receive side. I don't think there is that much of, you know, discussion about a particular bit or byte being here is, is, is that much of an issue, at least not on the Intel devices. Now, when we come to the config side, Okay. I, I, I would I, I would disagree with that. Simply. Okay. But yeah. Uh, well, device, yes. That. Yeah. Intel devices you will agree with, right? Yeah. So yeah. But yeah, you know, we definitely have to come to more programmable devices. One other point I want to lay out is the reason for building all this P4TC framework. We are making the descriptor format also programmable because it's PMD after all. A packet metadata that that is delivered with the with the packet to the host you define that packet metadata and that layout. That's how we want to go about it because it is important uh, to use these, uh, you know, DMAQs sometimes all the way to the application. Application may not need all the information you're sending from the device side, just some amount of the PMD that you need. So we, we definitely have thought through it in that regard. Um, uh, again, you know, we can agree to disagree that it's very difficult to uh, standardize some of these things, but what IO is an example that we were forced to, uh, you know, agree on, right? So, yeah. So uh, two points. You brought up the point about uh, standardization of NIC 
to the OCP. Uh, how come we're ready to define the generic NIC when we haven't even decided what a standard NIC is? That's a fair point. That, it is fair. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, things happen in parallel when the OCP feature set was being but it's defined. Not. We just like we just bring up vendors to decide what the standard NIC is, but we never, I never heard about an IPF being generic and uh, no one even asked us as NVIDIA. Right. So, you know, sometimes it just takes first something to be crafted, tested out and everything. And then, you know, you kind of bring about the community so together. I have a proposal. Sure. Something crafted, tested out and uh, uh, all the requirements that you put today, we have it already in Connectix. So why not Connectix? Yeah. So I, I would suggest that we propose in what io 2.0 and 3.0 if that's how you want to go about it no, or, already, already or went with idpf which was like 2000 2020 was branded as uh, intel it, it's Data not Data function it was no it is not and it that's was. why Sridhar pointed out why it is not iabf okay but and it, we haven't it was branded and it never made it upstream no so iabf was a common no so iabf the purpose was very was different as intel that yeah, and, and that's why it was for Intel. It was not a generic interface. Yeah, so three years later, the same driver, same architecture. It is not. So it is not. not. Okay. So it's not the same driver, but... Same architecture. Same, same marketing. It is same not hardware. the same architecture either. And marketing, yes, we are Intel, so we're going to market it as Intel first. But yeah, you know, so yeah, you can so say the same marketing. But yeah, so we had experience designing something which we could keep constant for our devices. And we still learned that there were other things that we needed to improve on to make it more vendor like neutral. Separate completion queues. That's for performance, but yeah, but we have that since two thousand one. Well, so. let, you know, we can we can talk about some of the features. I don't know if you you, you have. You can list any feature. I will tell you that we have. Okay, so you know, I'm I'm very happy for you. You should propose that yeah. as a generic interface. Pro yeah, publish so what's, your spec. What's, what's the difference here? Why? So, well, it, one difference is we are opening up the IP, as Strategy pointed out. Some oh, of the IP. Our IP is also open since two thousand twelve. Okay, so I, I would prop, you know really go about creating a consortium and you know okay. calling it as a generic yeah. interface and you know bringing people along. I mean, that's that's the goodness that we should be doing uh, from our side. You know, I, I we we have not stopped anybody for from doing the same thing, right? So yeah, yeah, but why call it generic? That's that's my issue with this. Uh, we, we, it it's it's, when, it's like it's we developed not... something and we are opening it up if anybody wants to kind of take it and we are ready to get feedback, particularly on the transport side, the config okay. side and everything. And that's why it's generic. And we are just proposing the basic feature set. You can come along and say, I want to add X, Y, Z feature. Okay. And you're part of that community to add more features to it. So. That's how it is generic. It has an open spec. It has an open architecture for the device. It is, you know, Intel and Google so are going to how, support it. How is it, it appealing to other vendors to come and join this uh, effort? This is what I'm missing here. Yeah, you want to? Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I think William or somebody wants to say something. Sorry. Yeah. The, uh, the, the Google um, virtual NIC, GV NIC, already supports this format. It supports two uh, descriptor formats. It's, it's legacy one and what we call TQO, which is this. Um, similar to how Vertigo supports two formats and actually IDPF does as well. So what we support in GV NIC is the split queue uh, model of IDPF. Um, so I think the, the one benefit here is like from our point of view is uh, we um, want to have a um, um, a single driver for our users, regardless of what our hardware is. And um, the best way to do this is to have a reference driver that um, is supported by multiple vendors, right? So if we want to um, in incorporate other vendors' hardware into our fleet, it is very helpful if it supports this standard um, or a, a single agreed on reference uh, interface that has all the features that our, our, our customers expect and can operate at the speeds that they expect. Yeah. So, so that's our view. Yeah, I, I get the point. The issue is it's too late for other vendors to, to join after. I mean, you say that supporting Vertio is going to hurt performance because you're going to have multiple layers to translate from the native like descriptor to the, I mean, from Vertio descriptor to the native descriptor. Now you have native support for IDPF. I don't. 
I'll give you one example. Say. So we do support VMXNet 3 as well as Vortio. Okay. Translation from VMXNet 3 is way faster than Vortio. Okay. So some descriptive formats are already kind of aligned better for you to adopt. And I can speak from experience. So that's why I'm saying like, you know, as a hardware vendor, you will find that IDPF is way more optimized, of course, uh, for hardware use case and, and, and also the whole control plane now i need to replace my the whole control the, plane. the control plane is soft is what i, I get, have been i get for free from berta right okay. in Can this I, case oh, I, I like to interject there is food outside <laughs> and the event called bits <laughs> nibbles bites words and then big words that's the name of the social event yeah has started there's, okay there's a lot of t-shirts if you want t-shirts oh yes wrap this course. up yeah <laughs> Okay, let's go eat some food. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Fine.